As we were going through Joel, we made it through Joel chapter 2. But then we backtracked a little bit to make sure we covered some topics that we didn't cover as we were just going through the verses, verse by verse. And so last time, if, if you missed, we were still in Joel chapter 2, and we talked about four different topics that came up in that chapter. And I've got questions to review each of those four things. So if you weren't here last time, you can pick up what we talked about. If you were, you can remember. Maybe. The first one, explain what this verse means. Rend your heart and not your garments. Oh, what is that term? Oh, no. Anna? I would say clean your heart, or not, you know, don't worry about your garments, but your heart is more important than the garments that you're wearing. Actually, so we said that the point of the verse is pretty clear, that your heart is more important than what's on the outside. And this is an instance of dialectical negation? Yes, but what we added, what we added last week, we added additional features. So we said it's clear, from, just you read the verse, and God wants me to focus on my heart more than I focus on what I look like on the outside. And this is what the Bible says all the way through. What we added to that last week, though, was that in, in ancient Hebrew, there was a figure of speech. There was a, a way to talk. And Jonah remembered, when he looked up, the, the, he remembered. Dialectical negation, we call it. What, what, we, what we said it was, was that in ancient Hebrew, sometimes, to emphasize one thing, you would negate something else. Even though that other thing was important too. So you have two things that are both worthwhile things. But if one is more important, you say no to one and yes to the other. So in this verse, talking about repentance, which we're going to talk about again today, you could repent with your heart, or you could repent on the outside. And in the big picture of the Bible, which one is important? Do we have to go over this again? <laughs> Is it important to repent in your heart or to show your repentance on the outside? Outside. Oh, oh man. Both. You wonder why we don't make it very far. It's both. It's both. The answer is both. God wants us to repent on the inside and he wants us to show that on the outside. The answer is both. But one of them is more important in that it has to come first. Which one is more important? In your heart. And when, when people in Hebrew would use this figure of speech, the fancy title is dialectical negation, what they would do is to emphasize that your heart is more important, they would say not with the other thing. So rend your heart and not your garments. Did they really mean that no, you shouldn't do anything on the outside? No. Okay, but they're saying no to this to emphasize this. This makes sense? Okay, and so it wasn't wrong for the people to tear their garments. But if they tore their garments without feeling contrition in their hearts, it didn't do any good. Okay, and so to emphasize how the heart part has to come first, and it's more important, we're going to say not to the other part. Okay, somebody remember another example that we used last week of another verse from the Bible that uses the same pattern? Two things that are both good, but to emphasize one, we're going to say not to one of those two good things. Yeah, there's one about sacrifices. Uh -huh. God says, I desire blank, not sacrifice. There you go, mercy. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Hosea 6, verse 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And again, the point of the verse is clear, right? What's, what's most important to God? Mercy. But when you read that verse, you can say, but God, you commanded all sorts of sacrifices. What do you mean that you desire mercy, not sacrifice, when you, God, commanded all the sacrifices? And well, what he means is what we're talking about here. Sacrifices are not bad. Sacrifices are good. But for a sacrifice to mean anything, what do you have to have first? Mercy. 
mercy. And so to emphasize mercy, in Hebrew you say, well, not sacrifice, it's mercy. What it really means is, I don't want just sacrifices. Even more, I want mercy. I don't want you just to rent your garments. Even more, I want you to rent your hearts. Am I following that? Okay, so whether you remember the word dialectical negation or not, that's not the important thing. The important thing is to recognize that the Bible uses different figures of speech. It's good to understand what those are saying. Next thing, how would you respond to someone who insists that the Old Testament and the New Testament teach about different gods? Excellent. And so we set this up that people today, they're always trying to criticize the Bible, right? And one of the things people will say is, well, look, at the Bible doesn't even, it's not even consistent. In the Old Testament, you've got this judgmental God who's just putting everybody to death. And then the New Testament, it's supposedly is about love. And you've got two different gods. <coughs> and Nina says, well, you could start by saying God in the Old Testament, when he describes himself, what does he say he's like? The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Showing mercy to thousands of generations, but um, punishing the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. Good. So showing mercy to thousands, and then showing justice and punishing those who reject him to the third and fourth generation. The point is that as God describes himself in the Old Testament, is he a God of grace and love? Yes. Absolutely. Just like in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, of course, we think about Jesus' love and forgiveness, but does the New Testament talk about justice and punishment and hell? Yes. Quite a lot. Absolutely. Quite a lot. Right? If you were to do a study of hell in the Bible, you'd probably read more New Testament passages than Old Testament. Okay, and the point is that the whole Bible presents us with the same God. He's a God of love and compassion, but a God who says he's going to judge those who reject him. It's the same God, Old Testament, New Testament. Questions about that? You know that in the New Testament, they just, I know people, I forget who those two were that came and Peter said they were about ready to die, you know, because they cheated on their givings. They give what they deserve and all that, they went to hell. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, he killed them right there. The Lord yeah. killed them right there. I mean, he destroyed them right there. Why? So Terry gives the example in the New Testament we hear about Ananias and Sapphira. I think we mentioned them last week as two people who came and they lied to Peter. And they lied to their church. And God immediately put them to death. Is that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? New Testament. The New Testament. So God is the same. He's a God of grace and compassion who forgives. But he's also a God who promises if you reject God, you're going to be judged. That's, that's what God says. All right, third one. I agree or disagree? God changes his mind. Agree. This is one where it should say, explain your answer. Because you could say either one if you explain it the right way. Some of you said, disagree. God, God does not change his mind. Why do you say that? Because God knows everything. What has God planned out from the beginning of the world? Everything. Everything. Psalm 139 says, All my days were ordained for me before one of them came to be. God has every day planned out. Really? Well, I said agree because there have been situations where he was going to uh, condemn a country or a uh, a person and he saw that they repented and he did not, and he changed his mind. Excellent. Right? So some of you said agree, and that's because in the Bible we hear about God, and the word that we, we studied last time was the word relent. So sometimes God relents. 
And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this punishment. But then people hear God's word and they repent. And then God relents. And, and the Bible says both things. That we have a God who doesn't change. That his promises are sure. That he's planned out the whole world. But we also have a God who, into his plan, has built in his relationship with people. And when people repent, God relents and he forgives them. On the flip side, when people turn away from him, then God punishes them and judges them. And what we said is we can't make this make perfect sense in our mind. How does God know and plan everything perfectly, and yet, how does he still forgive and relent from showing uh, judgment? And it's what the Bible describes. We have a God who's both infinite and powerful, and he's personal. And another thing that comes into play is our prayers, right? Yeah. So, God's planned out your whole life. So it doesn't do any good to pray, right? Uh, <laughs> what, is, what does God encourage us to do? Pray all the time. All right, so this is how God talked. Don't worry about your life. I have it all planned out, all for you. And you know what? Pray continually. Because I hear those prayers and those men. And with our little minds, we see, God, how, how can both of those things be true? Either you have it all planned out, or I could pray and you hear. And God says, I do both. I have a perfect plan for your life, and I hear every little thing that you pray to me. And they're both true. I was going to say, does that make sense? It doesn't really make sense. Do you, do you understand? Do you see what the Bible is saying? Okay, so we have a God, I think you would, to this question, the best answer would probably be to say, no, God doesn't change his mind. Because we know God is perfect and infinite and powerful. But, you have to add in, but God takes into consideration our prayers and our repentance. And sometimes our unbelief. That's all worked into God's plan. Yeah. Well, uh, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But the thief on the cross, and they were baptized with Jesus Christ, and they said to him, Sorry, I can't let you go to heaven because then we're baptized, you know. No, he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And they repent. Yeah. Oh, I mean, he, it's over. So he, you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven because the thief on the cross didn't happen under his circumstances. Yeah, Terry brings up a whole new topic, <laughs> which was baptism. So you give a good example. The Bible says to believe and be baptized and you'll be saved. And we can think of a few people in the Bible who weren't baptized, like the thief on the cross, and he was still saved by his faith in Jesus. And so we trust in Jesus' word today. He'll be with me in paradise. We know he was in heaven. Is there another hand? Mark? Everything's hinged on God's will. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and of course, it's hard for us to understand His will because we are finite within time. He's outside of time. Yeah. So everything that is going to happen or even everything that I'm going to think about, God already knew. Exactly. So Mark adds in now, we know it all depends on God's will. Mm -hmm. And you said the good thing, that God lives outside of time. Which is what we can't understand. We cannot picture no time. And so we're always thinking before or after or during. And that's not how God thinks. God is. There's no time. He always is. And so this maybe helps us understand all of our prayers. Uh, God's already, he's already worked it all in. He already knows how it's all going to go. Last one from last week. Whom does God want to repent and worship Him? Everybody. Everybody. Right? Remember some of the groups of people who were specifically called to repent last week? Babies. Who else? Bridegrooms. Newly, newlyweds, bridegrooms, and brides. Priests. Priests. Elders, everybody. Why did God say if they 
they're going to have a gathering to repent of their sins, why did God say everybody should be there? Because everybody was sinful. And we just see this over and over again in the Bible. Sin is a problem that every single human being has. Doesn't matter how old you are, man or woman, even if you're a priest. Sin is a problem we all have. So we all need to repent. And that brings us into today's lesson. I know we've talked some about repentance as we've gone through Joel. But this is such an important topic. We're going to spend the whole class today talking about one thing. Just about repentance. And hopefully you leave our class today thinking, I know exactly what that word means and how it applies to my life. Because this is key for our life as Christians. So we're in Joel chapter 2. We read these verses a lot. But we might as well keep reading them. So that we know them even better. Remember how we said that often in a book... The most important verses were found where? In the middle. In the middle. And so these are the middle verses of the book of Joel, which I think everybody would say, this is really what the book of Joel wants us to know well. So I'll read Joel chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. And today we're going to especially focus on repentance. So Joel chapter 2. Verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his chamber and the, his room and the bride her chamber, let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar, let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? I think about repentance from those verses today. I think I've told you that often in our church, we don't hear much from the book of Joel. So, you know, each Sunday we usually have three lessons. Usually one of them is from the Old Testament. It's not very often that that lesson is from the book of Joel. I think that there's only two times, if we follow the lessons we're supposed to, which we don't always do, but if we follow the lessons we're supposed to, I think there's two times in the cycle of lessons that we hear from Joel. One of those times is on Pentecost, because Joel is the one who says God's going to pour out his spirit on people. The other time that Joel shows up is on Ash Wednesday. And so Ash Wednesday is coming up. We're going to read these verses from Joel on Ash Wednesday. Why would these be good verses to read on Ash Wednesday? That's a time of repentance. It's a time of repentance. And so Ash Wednesday in the Christian church, for those who, who follow it, the idea is this is a day where we begin the season of Lent, and what do we confess about ourselves? We're sinful. How sinful are we? Why is it called Ash Wednesday? So you can burn your sins. <laughs> that's a, I never heard that, Cheryl. So we could burn our sins. Uh, that's a new take on Ash Wednesday. What? Ashes what? blow away. Yeah, and who who really is like ashes? We are. We are. We are. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. So Ash Wednesday is a day where Christians have said, I'm, I'm no, no better than dust. I'm going to go back to dust. I'm going to go back to ashes. And Karen, you said, what happens to ashes? They just blow away. They're so insignificant that the wind blows and they're gone. And that's you and me. And so what do we really need? Forgiveness. Jesus and so these are the verses from 
Joel, that I read on Ash Wednesday, return to the Lord. He's gracious. Return to him. Put your hope in his mercy. All right, so let's, let's talk about what repentance means. The Hebrew word for repentance is, you can see it there. It might be easier to see on your sheet. It's this word right here. You pronounce it shuv. Shuv. Kind of like S-H-U-V. Shuv. And this is the verb in Hebrew that's used for repentance. All right, it means, can you, can you see where it comes up? Which word? So your English Bible does not use the word repent. It uses a different word two times. I think I heard somebody say. Return. 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 Okay, now we might have different translations, but mine in verse 12 it says, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. And in verse 13, rend your heart, not your garments, return to the Lord your God. That word return, this is the Old Testament word for repentance. It's this word, shuv, and it means to return, or to turn back, or to turn around. Okay, so in the Old Testament, when God's people are, are told to repent of their sins, the word that's used is turn around, return, turn back. Okay? This word is not a word that only refers to repentance. Okay, in the Old Testament, this, this word is used about a thousand times. And of them, about a hundred refer to repentance. So what do you think the other 900 referred to? Turning around. Yeah. Turning around! <laughs> exactly. Alright, so maybe there's an army. And they go one direction. And they decide to turn around. And go the other direction. Okay, or maybe somebody went on a trip and they decide to return. And so they go back. And so it's not just a religious, spiritual word. It's the word that means return or turn back. Okay, but about 10% of the time... When this word is used, it's clearly talking about sin and repentance, return, or turn around. Right? So let's think about this. What is the picture of repentance from this word? You're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. How so? <laughs> well, we're not Just, following Jesus. We're not good. What are we yeah, following? We're returning to ourselves. Yeah. What we want to do. So there's this picture of we're on the wrong road. We're going the wrong direction. Right? We're not following God's will and God's word. Instead, we're following sin. Or we're following our own desires. And we're pretty content in that, right? We're just going right along on our own road. And what does God call us to do? Make a U-turn. Exactly. Make a U-turn. <clears throat> Turn around. Okay, you are heading towards sin and ultimately destruction and hell, right? You need to turn around, head back the other way, toward God, toward His forgiveness, toward His promises of heaven. Turn around. Okay, now, if you think of a U-turn, why, why would a U-turn be such a, a good picture of this? But just imagine, we... We sin, and to be honest, our sinful nature is really like it, right? Our sinful nature is really like to sin. And so when we think about, well, God tells me I'm not supposed to, what do we kind of want to do? We kind of want to do it, right? Like, so let's, make, let's stop a couple of the things. Right? Maybe I'll stop those things, but these aren't that bad. And we kind of want to go like halvesies, Right? Like, well, a little bit with sin and a little bit with Jesus. And, okay, how does a picture of a U-turn help us say it's not okay? All or none. It's all or none. Yeah. Okay? You're either going on this road or you're going on that road. 
And you can't go on both roads at the same time. You have to cut your car in half and put on another engine. If we go, we go two directions. Right? So this is the picture of repentance in the Old Testament. Repentance is turning from sin to, to God and God's forgiveness. Okay, so have this in your mind. Whenever you hear the Bible say repent, it's saying, turn around. Make a U-turn. Right? Your desires, your thoughts, you're going down this path. And you need to turn around completely. Turn to the Lord. Any questions about that? Yeah. In the Old Testament, sometimes it refers to dark and light. Good. So we have to be we're kind of like turning from darkness to light. Sure. So so we could think of a lot of different pairs that would fit. So Mark mentions how often in the Bible it talks about darkness and light. That would be a good example. So repentance is turning from darkness to light. In the Old Testament, you have the pair often is idols and God. So turn from idols, turn to God, right? Return to the Lord. You're turning around from the wrong direction that you're going. What's interesting is that in the New Testament, so the New Testament is in Greek, not Hebrew, the word for repentance doesn't mean turn around. So in the New Testament, when people are told to repent, there's a different word with a different picture. And it's this word, metanoao, and it means change your mind. Change your mind. So, if you knew a little Greek, this is just a compound word, which is mind and change. And so in, in, in the New Testament, when we hear repent, we hear Jesus say repent in our sermon today, in our gospel lesson. And it's this word, which, which means change your mind. Right? So what's the picture of repentance from that word? <laughs> That's how getting that out. Change your mind. You have to change your mindset. You know, like if you do one particular task every day for like sixty days, mm -hmm. then it becomes something you don't. Even, it comes becomes a, a staple that you don't even think about. Good, good. Did, you know, there's passages in the New Testament that talk about whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right. Think about such things. Okay, and so this picture of change your mind, by nature, what does our mind like to think about? Sin. Sin. Right? By nature, we, we, love to, we love to sin. We think sin is okay. We think of all sorts of excuses for sin, Right? Somebody else points out our sin, and what do we do? We get defensive. We argue with them about it. Right? So in the New Testament, repentance means change your mind. Okay, what you used to think was good, now you know is wrong. What you used to give lots of excuses about, now you're willing to say, no, it's my fault. It's all my fault. Right? When God calls you to repent, he's, he's calling us to change our mind about sin. Make sense? So, why do you think the Bible has two different words for repentance? Because it has two different meanings for repentance. <laughs> it's got two different languages. So, just to confuse us, right? Just to <laughs> no, it's, it's because having two pictures adds to our understanding of it, right? right? Yeah, because if you change your mind, it's easier to make the U-turn. Good, they obviously are very connected with each other, right? Both of them have this concept, I, I'm thinking sin is okay, and I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna change. They're not like they're opposites of each other at all, but well, what it does is that the Bible gives us these two different pictures to think about. So when you hear in the Bible, Jesus or John the Baptist or God's words say, repent, these are the two pictures that, that can come to mind, right? God is calling me to turn around, to turn from sin and turn to God. God's calling me to change my mind, to stop loving sin or excusing sin or accepting sin, and instead to admit it and to confess it. <coughs>
How do the words of Joel chapter 2 encourage God's people to do these things? Do you see in these verses the idea of turning around? That's the easy one because the words actually use it, right? Return to me with all your heart. Return to the Lord your God. It's a song. Because okay. the prose sounds so much better than the song. <laughs> well, true. So repentance isn't just necessary because God says so. It actually is a good thing, right? So living on the road to sin and hell and destruction is actually not as good as living on the road of God's forgiveness and eternal life. Return to the Lord. Lydia? This passage here, it says, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. So that goes back to earlier the question about does God change his mind? Excellent. Yeah, and we said the word in Joel is relent, right? Relent. Yeah. relent. And so we know God's got everything all planned out, but he makes us this promise that when we return to him, when we repent, God relents from sending the calamity that we deserve. Last thing in this section is to reveal, is repentance something inward or outward? Oh, oh. <laughs> it's like we just talked about this, right? I just thought I'd put it on there just to, to see. It's both. All right, which one has to come first? Inward. Which one is ultimately more important? Inward. But if we repent on the inside, what will always happen on the outside? It'll show itself. Okay, it'll show itself. If we repent in our hearts, it's going to show itself in our lives. All right, next page. What motivates repentance? The Holy Spirit. No, that's, that's good. You can pretty much use the Holy Spirit for most questions. The Holy Spirit does a lot of things. So that's absolutely true. Let's narrow it in a little bit more than that. We often think that fear of threats motivate repentance. Sometimes it does. So in the verse that Lydia just read, it calamity. Right? If you and I get it in our heads that, well, if I keep doing this, bad things are going to happen, does that sometimes help us stop what we're doing? Sometimes it does, temporarily, until that threat of calamity passes, and then, and then we'll go on. So it's true that sometimes people can, can repent out of fear. Okay? But that's really not the best motivator for repentance. Why not? Why is it just being afraid? Because it's just like putting a band-aid on a gaping wound. It's just temporary. It's just, it's just putting a band-aid on a gaping wound. And so fear itself isn't the goal either, right? So to be afraid of something, that's that's not the goal. Okay, Dave? I was going to say love would be the motivation for the man. This is what the Bible teaches us, that the true motivation for repentance is love. I've got three passages on your sheet. This is the one we've been hearing from Joel. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. In that passage, what is it that's motivating us to go to God? His abounding love. His abounding love. And what if it said, return to the Lord your God, or he's going to destroy you? What if it said that? That would be being true uh, fear. People still might be motivated to return to God, but it would be a whole different attitude, right? Right? What the Bible presents, look at God's love for you. This is why we go back to God. And now if you think if the picture is to take a U-turn, remember, repentance isn't just turning away from sin. That would be like a stop sign, Right? So if repentance were just turning away from sin, it'd be like a stop sign. But repentance isn't a stop sign. What is it? A U-turn, which means you have to be going back to something. What are you going to? God. And what draws us to God? 
is love and kindness and mercy. Okay, here's a verse from the New Testament. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So when God is kind to us, his kindness is meant to motivate us to repent. Okay? Now, can we be honest and say often we misuse God's kindness? Absolutely. Right? So let's imagine that you're living in a sin. And this happens to us, right? We just get caught up in a sin. Let's imagine that your life continues to go well. Doesn't this happen sometimes? That you actually are falling away from God and your life continues to go well. What is God doing to you? He's been kind to you because when we sin, what should God do? Just destroy us, right? And so sometimes when we sin, God doesn't just allow bad things to happen. He doesn't smash us. and He's still being kind to us. And what is that meant to call us to? Yes, Repentance, but instead, what do we do? Take advantage. We take advantage of it. Well, look at God's not doing anything. I'm just going to keep doing it. Doesn't matter, right? I can do whatever I want to, and God, He's just going to leave. So the Bible presents this opposite thing. If if in your life you recognize that you're, you're sinning and you haven't you haven't confessed it, and then you look at your life and you say, and God's still blessing me. Don't think to yourself, great, I can just keep doing it. Think to yourself, wow, God is gracious, isn't he? God is so gracious. He should have put me to death years ago, but his kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. Maybe? He also says he's slow to anger. He doesn't say he's going to get angry. Good. So the Bible does talk that sometimes God's patience does run out. And it says he's slow to anger. It doesn't say God is never angry. It says he's slow to anger. And so if you are, are seeing God's kindness in your life, take that as an invitation. God, I want to turn to you. I want to turn away from sin. I don't want to see your anger. I want to just live in your love and kindness. One more passage. Here's Peter talking in the book of Acts. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So here we have a promise that's tied to repentance. What is Peter's promise when people repent? Refreshing. Refreshing. That sounds good, doesn't it? And what's the most refreshing thing from this verse? Uh, it comes from God. And what, what is the refreshing? Your sins are wiped away. Your sins are wiped away. Now, you know, the Bible often presents a picture of a courtroom, right? Like we're going to stand before God in a courtroom. And what if we didn't have this promise? What if it, the Bible just said, repent, and we'll see what God decides? How good would that make you feel? Everybody needs to repent. You need to go to court with God. I think we'd be cautious. You'd be cautious and like, I don't know how that's going to turn out. Right? God knows about sin's feelings. Yeah, actually, if I go to court with God, I'm going to learn things about myself that I didn't even know. Right? But what the Bible does is it presents this courtroom, but it tells you that the verdict has already been declared. In God's eyes, because of Jesus, what's the verdict? Not You're not guilty. You're innocent. All right? And so this is what God, God says, come to me with all of your sins because I've already forgiven them. Come to me with all your sins because I've already, through Jesus, declared you not guilty. This is what motivates us. Does this make sense? But then why are you worried? Be because your sinful nature refuses to believe that God is as good as he says he is. Right? Your sinful nature says, Karen, God can't, he's not that good. Right? He can't be that good. Maybe you should just try to hide it. Just, to, just try to ignore it. You got a better luck that way. Because God, he can't be as good as he says he is. 
any time that we think that God is this angry judge who's out to get us, right, what we're doing is, is we're, we're refusing to believe what God says about himself. We're refusing to believe in Jesus. Okay, and isn't this the case? Often, maybe even people that you invite to come to church, they'll say something like, well, I don't belong there. Or I'm not good enough. Or, no, you don't want people like me there. And hopefully you say something back to that because it's not true. Right? It's not true. But what's that person expressing? Their doubt. They don't know who God really is. They think God is out to get them. And what you can say back is, you know, I don't, I don't deserve to be there either. But you need to know who God is. God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Okay, often what keeps people from repenting is this fear of God. They don't know about God's kindness and God's promises. That's what we want to share with them. This is where it's good to know Bible verses. God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You can say, are you part of all people in the world? Yes, you are. God wants you to be saved. He wants you to know about Jesus. All right, so what motivates repentance? God's love. God's love. God's love. We could say the gospel, the good news about Jesus. This is what motivates us to repent. Okay, and so maybe one of you, even right now today, there's something that you're hiding in your heart or your life. And you're embarrassed by it. And you feel guilty about it. Right? Look at what God says to you. You can bring it to God. You can be honest about it. You can repent of it because you know that God has forgiven you in Jesus. You don't need to live with guilt and fear. All right, next section, who needs to repent? All right, review, who was included in Joel's call to repentance? Everybody. Everybody, right? With special emphasis on elders and priests, and children, and babies, and newlyweds. Right? Everybody needs to repent because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's two verses from the New Testament that I think are really helpful with repentance. First is a little story from the Gospel of Luke. So Luke chapter 13 says, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And this is one of the things in the Bible that we know nothing else about. We know about Pilate, right? Pontius Pilate, he's a Roman governor. Apparently, what did Pontius Pilate do? He killed some Galileans, some Jews from Galilee. What were those Jews from Galilee doing when Pilate killed them? Sacrifice. Making sacrifice. This is hard for us to, we don't know all the details. Somehow, there were Galileans, they were believers in God, who were making sacrifices, and Pilate killed them as they were making sacrifices. And from what we hear about Pilate and the Roman government, this isn't that surprising. We just don't know more information about it. So an awful thing happens to people who sure seem to be God's people. What's Jesus going to say? Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. Right? So something bad like this happens, and what's our first thought? They must have been really bad. They must have been really bad. Yeah. And you can imagine maybe it's people in Jerusalem, like, yeah, those Galileans. Yep. I, they're bad. He says, no, that's not it. It's not that they're worse. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. So if I hear about some people who meet this untimely, terrible death, I shouldn't think, well, they must have been bad people. What should I think to myself? I'm as bad as they are. That's what should happen to me. And so what should that lead me to do? Repent. Repent. You hear about some terrible accident or tragedy, maybe it's not an accident, some violence or 
blood shedding. Right? Don't think to yourself, yep, yeah, served him right. right. Every one of them is a call to, wow, God, that, that could happen to me any day. So I want to repent today. Okay, Jesus gives another example. Are those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Again, we don't know any more details about this. Apparently there was a building collapse and 18 people died. And everybody knew about it. It was on the news. It was a big deal. Okay? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? No. I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And so, I mean, you think a building collapse. This is, there's not a pilot involved. It seemed like a terrible accident. And did the people who died, were they worse than everybody else? Yeah. No, but when I see that, what does it lead me to think? That's what we think. Yeah, that's what we think by nature. Wrong place at the wrong time. Wrong place at the wrong time. You know, those poor guys. What does Jesus say I should do when I hear news like this? Repent. You should repent. Okay, and so we're talking about who needs to repent. What's Jesus teaching us? Everybody. And how often? All the time. You know, this is one benefit of, we often complain about the news, right? And it's always bad. Maybe sometimes it's good for us to hear bad news. Okay? Because what does bad news remind us of? That we are sinful. And we're sinful too. Right? And so you watch the news and this terrible thing happened in another country or this terrible thing happened in Tulsa and hopefully our hearts go out to those people. We don't think, well, serves them right or I'm better than them. But then it's also always this call to God, that could be me. You know, even that, that should be me. But please forgive my sins. For Jesus' sake. Well, then our time is short, so we should not take it for granted. Our time is short. Okay. Yeah. Don't take it for granted. After is Siloam another name for Jerusalem? That's a good question. I don't think so. Because in Jerusalem there was the pool of Siloam. I don't think it refers to the whole city. But it may have been like a part of the city. So I've always understood this to be, this was something that happened near the Pool of Siloam, which was part of Jerusalem. But th there's more I could learn about that. So I don't think Siloam is used to cover the whole city. It's just a... Right, so it seems like Siloam, this tower is something that collapsed in Jerusalem. Good question. Right? Here's another passage from the New Testament. Hebrews 3 says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today. So repentance is for who? All. Everyone, all. When? All the time. All the time. Or you could say today. And then tomorrow, what will you say? Today. Right? Repentance is for all. Today. We're going to end by thinking a little bit about the role that repentance plays in the Lutheran Church. And so hopefully you realize, coming to our church, that repentance is a big deal to Lutherans. And the easy answer is because it's a big deal in the Bible. Here's some, some ways that Lutherans have talked about repentance. I brought this up before, that when Martin Luther wrote his 95 Theses, the statements for debate that started the, the Lutheran Reformation. The very first thesis was when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Martin Luther would have like underlined or bolded a few words in that. Which words do you think he would have bolded? What do you think he wanted to emphasize? The entire life, the entire life is one of repentance. Okay, so is repentance just this one time thing? You got to do it once and then you become a Christian and then you're set. It's a 
whole life thing. Okay? So that's what the first of the 95 theses <laughs> emphasizes. You want to think about being a Christian, it's about repentance. Repentance is about your whole life as a Christian. Why would Martin Luther have written that as the very first of the 95 theses? This is where you have to know the context a little bit. Right? Somebody remember why he wrote the 95 theses? What he was combating? Indulgences. Indulgences. Remember what an indulgence is? Or have you ever learned what an indulgence is? So an indulgence is... It's Technically, it's supposed to get you out of time and purgatory. It's release from purgatory for a certain period of time. And in Martin Luther's day, there was a man traveling around his area selling indulgences. So basically, you pay this amount of money, and you get out of purgatory faster. Yeah. And okay. how do you know? that that person wasn't just doing it for himself and not for the church. <laughs> well, see, everybody knew he was, he was doing it to build the Pope a new church. So, to this day, the largest Christian church in the world is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And it was built with the money from indulgences from the days of Martin Luther. That's how the Pope built the largest Christian church in the world. Okay, so that's why they were collecting money. Right? But just think, all that we've talked about repentance, if if you went out and you bought an indulgence, how would that change your attitude about repentance? I don't need to do it. I don't need to do it anymore. I paid for it. I paid for it. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm in. That, that, that's sorted. There's, there's, there's stories about Martin Luther would run into somebody drunk on the streets of Wittenberg, Germany, where he was a pastor and teacher. <coughs> And he would say, what are you doing out here drunk? And he'd say, Father Martin, don't worry about me. Look it. I've got this indulgence. He'd hold it up. I've got this piece of paper. I've, it's already taken away. And so that led Martin Luther to write. If we want to get back to the Bible's teaching. It starts with repentance. And the part of repentance we need to emphasize, it's not a one-time thing. It's not paying a, a fine. It's the entire life of a Christian is one of repentance. If you go to the last page, you hopefully know that in the Lutheran Church, we have some confessions, which means documents that state as clearly as possible what we believe as Lutherans. They're called the Lutheran Confessions. And one of those Lutheran confessions is called the Augsburg Confession. And this was kind of the original document Lutherans at the time of Martin Luther writing down, this is what we believe from the Bible. And the Augsburg Confession talks about repentance. Here's what it says. Properly speaking, repentance consists of two parts. One is contrition, or the terrors that strike the conscience when sin is recognized. The other is faith, which is brought to life by the gospel, or absolution. This faith believes that sins are forgiven on account of Christ, and consoles the conscience and liberates it from terrors. Thereupon good works, which are the fruit of repentance, should follow. Right. This is saying some really important things. So, according to the Augsburg Confession, which is saying what the Bible says, there's two parts to, to repentance. What are the two parts to it? Contrition. Contrition? Contrition? Work by conscience. Oh, close. No. So, contrition, what, what is it that makes our hearts convicted and terrified of our sins and sorry for our sins? The law. Oh, good. It's the law of God. The law, which works on our conscience, which makes us feel guilty. So repentance consists of contrition, so sorrow in our hearts that's worked by God's law. Right? The wages of sin is death. You shall have no other gods. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And we hear these things and it convicts us. I'm not like that. Right? But that's not all it is. Number two. Contrition and faith. faith. 
faith in Jesus, and that's worked by the gospel. Gospel. So faith worked by the gospel, all the promises about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. Right? So this is how Lutherans talk. For someone to repent, it means contrition, sorrow in your heart over your sin, and faith. Faith in Jesus and his salvation on the cross. Repentance is contrition and faith. And where do good works fit in? You know, as it mentioned, good works. They follow. They're the fruit. The fruit of repentance. So we've emphasized repentance is not just inside, it's outside, right? And that's what the Lutheran confessions say. Repentance leads to fruits, which would be the good works, the changes in your life that God works through the gospel. Could we also say evidence? They're evidence of repentance. Yeah. Evidence of repentance. See? Did, did Luther first present this in the body of the will, thinking that there might have been some happening? study that more or less So I'm glad that you remember the bondage of the will, which we studied on Wednesday nights for a while, this last summer. I don't know if, if he there makes this twofold distinction of contrition and faith, although Martin Luther certainly taught that lots of different places. Right? But what they're trying to emphasize is one, repentance is true sorrow over sin. It's not just saying the words. It's not just buying the bill. It's true sorrow in your heart. But two, repentance is always accompanied by faith in Jesus. Okay, and examples in the Bible that help us with this is, did Judas repent of his sin? Yes. Judas betrayed Jesus. Well, no, he had, did he repent? He had contrition, but he didn't have faith. Excellent. He was missing the second part. Did Judas feel bad about betraying Jesus? Yes. He despaired. He hanged himself. He felt really bad. Okay, but did he repent? No, because because he didn't have faith in Jesus. Okay, if you think of repentance like a U-turn, he he got to the stop sign, right? I shouldn't have done this, but he didn't he didn't come to Jesus. Okay, and so repentance is contrition and faith. And here's a few passages from the Bible. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what John preached. Here's what Jesus says about himself. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And maybe just notice that when repentance is talked about, it's always accompanied by forgiveness. Right? It's not just feeling sorry, it's feeling sorry and knowing that God offers me forgiveness. Acts 38, when the people heard that they were heard this, so this is on Pentecost, Peter just told them that they had crucified Jesus. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Which part of repentance would that be? Contrition. 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 And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So this idea of repentance is this sorrow in my heart. And God, through the gospel, then works his faith in Jesus and his forgiveness for salvation. Right? And how often is this a part of our lives? Every day. Every day. Right? Every day when you catch yourself sinning. You say, God, I'm sorry. I mean it. And then what do you think of? Jesus. And he took your sins away. Just to show you that this is not what everybody teaches about repentance, here's how the Catholic Church responded. So after the Lutheran Reformation, the Catholic Church held a big council called the Council of Trent in which the Catholic Church basically condemned everything that Lutherans teach and believe. Here's what the Council of Trent says about repentance. If anyone denies that for complete and perfect remission of sins, three actions are required in the penitent person, making up, as it were, the material of the sacrament of penance, namely contrition, confession, 
and satisfaction, which three are called the parts of repentance, where it says that there are only two parts of penance, namely terror struck into the conscience by the knowledge of sin and faith conceived from the gospel or from absolution, by which one believes that his sins are forgiven through Christ, let him be anathema. Do you know what anathema is? Damned. Damned. Damned to hell. Okay. So the Catholic Church responded by saying, if anybody believes that repentance is Contrition and faith in Jesus. What's going to happen to that person? They're going to hell. Anybody who believes that's going to hell. Because the Catholic Church said, no, repentance is three things. What are the three things? Contrition and Right? Now, there's something in common, right? Contrition. Contrition. So the Catholic Church said, you should be sorry for your sins. Absolutely, we agree. But then they have these two things. Confession and... So you got to confess your sins. We would, I mean, I think we include that as part of contrition. Catholic Church says you're supposed to confess it just to the priest, though, right? In a certain way. What satisfaction? Famous. Exactly. So how do you make satisfaction for your sins? You have to do do the, the acts that the priest tells you. So in the Catholic Church, repentance is you feeling con contrite, you confessing your sins to a priest and you doing whatever the priest tells you to make satisfaction for those sins. Those three things. Right? What? What is completely missing? Jesus. Jesus is missing and in this system good works become what? The material of the sacrament of repentance. That's John is using the correct theological terms. So maybe we would say the the cause or the source. The source of repentance. Right? You have not fully repented until you have done the right works to make satisfaction for what you've done. Right? Instead of my good works are the result of God's forgiveness, my good works are needed for there to be any forgiveness at all. Okay, do you see the difference? It's all on you. It's all on you. And so, some of you have spent time in the Catholic Church. Some of you know Catholics. And how do Catholics always feel? Guilty. Guilty. <laughs> they always feel guilty. And that's because they're good Catholics. Right? That's exactly what the Catholic Church has taught them to feel. If you're a good Catholic, you need to feel guilty. No lie. Right? Well, there is some. It just it's it's all clouded by. You need to feel sorry. You need to confess. You need to do these things. Repeat. And what's missing is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus. Okay. And so to end, what comfort and encouragement does knowing the Bible's teaching of repentance give to your heart and life? Peace. You're forgiven. You have peace. You have peace. And a child of God. I'm a child of God. <coughs> so when we sin, what do we do? Go to the Lord. We go to the Lord. We, we rely on His grace. We rely on His grace. Right? We confess and we trust in Jesus. And we know that we're forgiven. Right? And so repentance is just, just the core of a, a life as a Christian. It's, it's the entire life of someone who believes in Jesus every day. It's confessing our sins and trusting in Jesus over and over and over again. I like the idea of taking my sins to the cross of Jesus and believing. Good. The problem is So we take our sins to Jesus' cross and then we leave them there. And that's hard. Because then we walk away and we like to take them back with us again, right? Okay, in our sermon today, we're going to talk more about repentance. And one of the things that I'll say is that uh, if, if you're struggling with repentance, there's two, two things that might happen. One, you might become very proud. Right? You might become proud if you're not repenting regularly. You're going to become proud and think a lot better than all those other people. Right? And where does pride lead? More sin. To hell. 
Okay, but on the opposite side, um, if you're not repenting the way that God calls you to, you're going to fall into despair. Because if, if all you do is see your sins and you don't see Jesus, how are you going to feel? Guilty. And worthless and in despair. Where does despair lead you to? Disaster. To hell. <laughs> to hell. Right? And so what the Bible teaches us, Christians are to be the most humble people in the world. How can we look down on anybody else when we know our own sins? But Christians are meant to be the most confident, assured people in the world. Because I know all my sins are taken away in Jesus. At the same time, not proud, not despairing, but trusting in Jesus as our Savior. Thanks for coming today. Come back again next week. Thank you. Right? What we still need to talk about more is the Holy Spirit. So the next week or two, we're going to talk more about the Holy Spirit when we saw it come up in Joel. And then we'll be ready to move on. A little bit further in the Let's go over the prayer. Dear Lord God, sometimes the, the simplest concepts are the most difficult for us to grasp. In your word, from Old Testament to New Testament, you call your people to repent, to turn from sin, to change their minds, to, to turn to you. And Lord, this is hard. First of all, because our sinful natures don't want to. And second, because we doubt that you're really as loving and forgiving as you say that you are. Dear Lord, we pray that you use your word today and every time we hear it to work repentance in our hearts, contrition over our sins, that we be sorry for them, but trust in Jesus as our Savior, that we not doubt all that he's done to save us. Dear Lord Jesus, help us each day to repent and to turn to you. In your name we pray. Amen.